Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ansel, um, who is Assistant Professor of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging and of Psychiatry uh, at Yale. He, he got his PhD in Medical Physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2014. He had previously gotten a, a master's degree in the same area from uh, Wisconsin. He then became a postdoc fellow at Yale in 2016. And uh, when, when did you uh, first get an appointment as assistant professor, Ansel? Uh, well, no, I started as a postdoc in 2014. Oh, and then I, see. I think 2017 was when I started as, as, as faculty. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the website is, uh, says 2016. Yeah, okay. Maybe finish, yeah. <laughs> maybe finish that. Uh, the two prongs of his research include the characterization of novel pet imaging targets and paradigms and applying them to study psychiatric conditions in new and innovative ways. And he is going to lead the discussion of the article uh, that is shown on neuroimaging to study the dose related brain kinetics and target engagement of buprenorphine in vivo from neuropsych pharmacology. The floor okay. is yours. All right. Thank you, Hank. Um, so, first of all, um, I'm happy for this, for this to be a very casual kind of conversation. So, you know, if anybody has questions or comments, I, you know, please feel free to pop in at any point. Um, I'm just kind of going to run through this quickly. So, um, this uh, this paper was um, a little interesting. I think that I, my my first kind of I think overarching comments is that I wish it were a little bit more focused, a little bit. Um, but uh, we'll <laughs> we'll get there as we go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but um, I think we'll we'll try to kind of make sense of of the the really actually you know it's a, it's a lot of data that's presented, so we'll try to kind of make sense of that together. Um, so I just put together a couple slides here that kind of summarize the, the rationale and the background because it helped me organize my thoughts with how to best present it. And then um, after that, I just have, you know, on the slides, just the different various figures and a couple su supplemental figures I think are informative. Um, but I anticipate maybe on the screen hopping back and forth between the actual paper and the figures. Uh, so just in terms of the ra rationale, um, so of course this the study focuses on uh, PET imaging of carbon-11 labeled buprenorphine, and so you know um, we we all know that buprenorphine is really key for um, addiction maintenance therapy. Um, one of the motivations to do this study is actually kind of a discrepancy on the neuropharmacology of buprenorphine that the authors cite, and they say that there's been this kind of inverted U analgesic dose response that's been shown for animals, but in humans, it's more consistent with a full agonist dose response. So um, they really uh, claim that there's a lot of, um, and I, you know, this is fair, a fair point. There's a lot to be learned from identifying kind of what sort of receptor occupancies with buprenorphine are consistent with, but with the um, doses that are used both for analgesic purposes, and then also for purposes of more of like, uh, um, OUD type of maintenance. And so one of the key goals of this study was to assess the range of receptor occupancies of buprenorphine across these doses. Um, a second uh, key thing that, that this paper really goes after is to examine the selectivity of buprenorphine. And that's one nice thing about being able to use a radio labeled version of buprenorphine um, is that you can really directly assess the selectivity of it to different subtypes. So um, of course, with all different um, different compounds that have that are you know that bind to opioid receptors, it's very common for them to have you know very high affinities for a lot of different subtypes, not just mu, which is the most densely expressed in the brain. So um, the paper cites um, kind of, and there was a little bit of discrepancy between the introduction and the discussion on these values, but these are the the values cited in the discussion. Uh, uh, it, it, it cites it, um, kind of the, the, the relative uh, KI values, uh, which is inversely related to affinity. Um, buprenorphine's high affinity partial agonist for the opioid receptors um, at about 0.1 nanomolar, a little lower, and then um, half an order of magnitude higher than antagonist for kappa, so 0.44, an antagonist for delta at 
and then an agonist for the orphan receptor ligand family of, a, of about 285 nanomolar. So if we think about um, you know, what the PET signal is going to tell us with this um, radio tracer for buprenorphine, um, if we think about the binding potential, which is our traditional outcome measure that we often use in PET, um, binding potential is the um, the, the ratio is the um, ratio uh, equilibrium ratio of specific uh, basically specific binding at a given target. And if we have multiple receptor subtypes, then it's just basically the non-displaceable fraction times the sum of the receptor density over the KD, which is inversely uh, related to the affinity. So you can see here that um, if if it were the case that all the receptor densities for these subtypes were the same, then the uh, we should still have dominant signal from the mu signal based on the relative affinities of buprenorphine. Um, but of course, mu is more widely expressed in the brain than these others. So we would expect that the largest component of um, of of uh, specific binding would come from mu opioid receptor binding. That having been said, it's always very good to characterize if we have some small detectable mu component or delta component, um, or I guess orphan uh, or um, uh, orphan receptor ligand uh, component as well. And so a secondary goal of this study was to assess the selectivity of the radio ligand buprenorphine to um, to opioid receptor subtypes, and this was done with a variety of blocking studies uh, in the rodent. So I think it would be best actually if we kind of hop over right to um, right to those rodent studies. Um, I think it's a good place to start. Um, so I think what I'll do is we can, because th th these really were almost like two separate studies that do go together. So what I'll do is I'll kind of give the methods and the results for the rat studies, and then we'll come back and do the methods and the results for the monkey studies. Um, the, the rodent studies are pretty straightforward and pretty small, so this should go quickly. Um, so for the um, for the rodent studies, these were um, these were micro pet studies. Uh, they were acquired on a micro pet uh, CT scanner. Um, they gave buprenorphine, and then they gave um, blocking doses with an N of four. Um, for, yeah, and then they did this in how many? Oh, does it say? I don't know that it says. Okay, so they did this. Um, they they did this in rodents, and then they gave blocking doses of different uh, blocking compounds prior to the scan. Um, okay, so here it is. Right. Okay, so this was they did it in four rodents per condition, and so the 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 blocking compounds that they used was the non-selective opioid receptor antagonist naloxone, and so they they called this a positive control in the study. And so here, ideally, you're going to see just complete displacement of, of the carbon-11 label buprenorphine. Then they gave a bunch of selective compounds. So they gave the selective U opioid receptor antagonist naloxonazazine, which I'm actually not familiar with, um, but I guess this is a highly selective mu compound. They gave um, the kappa opioid receptor antagonist uh, norbinol, alf I'm not going to say that right, but they gave a kappa opioid receptor selective antagonist as well and then a delta opioid receptor antagonist, uh, naltrindol. And so the idea here is that by seeing reductions in the carbon-11 labeled buprenorphine uptake, uh, we can assess kind of the extent to which uh, mu, delta, and kappa are all contributing to the total buprenorphine signal. For this analysis, they used a reference region approach. Um, so they, um, a big part of this, you know, the I, I would say the um, kind of canonical way to measure this would actually be do with our, to do it with arterial blood sampling, but that's really difficult to do in a rodent, so it's not unreasonable to use, you know, a reference region type of an approach for rodent imaging. So for this, they used the um, the cerebellum as a reference, which is, um, I, I guess it's been done in rats. That's not, for, for opioid receptors, that's a little unusual. Um, the occipital cortex is more of a typical reference region but if you know if there's evidence supporting this, it's not completely unreasonable. Um, and so they they cited this as a, a region um, of 
negligible mu and delta opioid receptor expression with limited kappa re receptor expression. And then they express their outcome measures as ratios of a given brain region relative to that of the cerebellum. So let's just go ahead and jump here to the, um, to the results for this, um, for these rodent studies. So, um, so the key things here are we have our first in the, well, these are two different kind of colors. So let's start with the yellow. So this is naloxone. This is our non-selective compound. And you can see that there's essentially near complete displacement with that in most of the brain regions. And then if you look at the mu selective antagonist, you can see relatively comparable levels, if not even lower uptake in um, lower uptake in the um, in the mu selective uh, uh, with the mu selective compound uh, relative to the non selective compound. So that does actually give us a hint that there might be some sort of, um, of uh, specific binding in the cerebellum that's being altered. Um, but I think for these purposes, painting with a broad brush, you know, it does say that um, it does say that there's a pretty hefty mu component. And then I think the really key thing here is that there's no significant differences with the delta selective antagonist or the kappa selective antagonist relative to baseline. And so that gives us some good evidence that, um, you know, the kappa and delta contributions to the specific binding of this, of this compound are, 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 um, are probably quite small. So we can say that in this case, when we're imaging buprenorphine, it's probably, we're probably predominantly looking at the mu opioid receptor signal. Sorry, Hank, you're, I, I, can't, I can't hear what you're saying. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, I think that that's really notable. Um, and it was w one of the major reasons I thought this would be a useful uh, article to discuss because I think you know, the, the, the pharmacology, uh, the, in, the in vitro pharmacology, as you reviewed from the beginning, shows that the kappa uh, binding is not as uh, there's not the same affinity as for mu, but it's close. I mean, it's a half an order of magnitude, but, um, and, and that's kind of surprising that, uh, that, that this is so clearly uh, an indication that the binding is almost entirely mu. Well, the, the other consideration, and I, I, I should have looked this up ahead of time, and I, I, I did not, would be the receptor, de the relative receptor densities of mu related to kappa, right? And I know mu is greater, and I, it's just a question of how much more. But um, even, um, but even uh, if you look at relative to baseline, um, the the mu, I mean the kappa and the delta seem to contribute nothing uh, relative to baseline. I mean they seem to be virtually identical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, but I think it, you know. The, the question is how much of the B max of mu is swamping out that of kappa and delta, you know? Um, but, but yeah, I, I do think that in general, that's a really good point. <coughs> so, um, okay, so, so, the take home from this first set of studies is that we're basically, when we're looking at buprenorphine binding potential at the, the, the very least, it's mostly, you know, mu opioid receptors. So now let's go to the plethora of non-human primate studies that have been done. Um, and so that starts here with these co-injection studies. So, um, they, uh, basically do a, a pretty thorough dose response. Uh, doing co-injections of, um, of the radio tracer along with um, known uh, cold masses of buprenorphine. And, and so they first do what's, what they call a microdose. This is simply just, uh, you know, what we would call high molar activity. Um, uh, that's, that would be essentially a typical uh, PET scan, which are, which are standard, you know, you, 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 want, you want your high molar activity to be sure that you're A, measuring binding potential correctly, be not inducing any sort of pharmacological effects on the, on the study participants. Um, so it so we have the high molar activity buprenorphine scan as well as increasing doses um, across a different range of doses, uh, which I think is 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 quite nice. 
And so they do this, I think, again, in NO4 and acquire um, 90 minutes of, of pet data for all of that. So that's actually a lot. You know, this is four times one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is 24 different PET scans. So that's a, that's a good amount. Um, it's interesting that the data were acquired on an HR Plus, which is a little bit of an older um, older PET scanner. Um, it suggests these data might be a little on the older side, although there's still certainly some HR Pluses that are being used out there. Um, I think with, with this tracer, it's important to consider just what kind of um, anesthesia is being used in the monkeys. So they use an init initial dose of uh, ketamine to knock the animal down and then maintain anesthesia on propofol. Um, so that should be pretty reasonable for the opioid receptor system. Um, for the non-human primate studies, uh, the animals, they also did um, arterial blood sampling so they could actually measure um, measure what the volume of distribution. Um, and then from that, uh, yeah, so they, they measure the arterial um, input function. They also measure total concentrations of buprenorphine and plaza using mass spec. Um, this could actually also be done just by measuring what the parent, what the uh, parent concentration is in plasma since you're, and multiplying times the known um, molar activity uh, accounting for the cold dose. Um, so it's a little redundant, but I think that's a nice uh, confirmation with two different measurement approaches. Uh, their quantification methods are actually not 100% uh, clear. So they don't really, um, so for example, they say that they measure uh, VT with the Logan plot graphical method, but then they report K1 values and the Logan plot actually doesn't give you K1 values per se. So um, I'm not 100% sure how they actually did their modeling. I'm gonna assume it was with either a two tissue or one tissue type of model because they have the furrow arterial um, input function. Um, so we're gonna have to kind of make those kinds of assumptions as we move forward. Um, they then um, used, uh, so then they used the binding potential relative to uh, plasma concentration as their outcome measure. That's um, th th that's still a you know that that's an acceptable outcome measure, but I would say the more conventional measure would be actually BP binding potential relative to non-displaceable uptake, and so that would just be this value divided by the VND, and so that gives you more of a binding potential type of um, a standard like DVR type of measurement rather than uh, binding potential relative to concentration in plasma. Um, but then when you go, really their main outcome measurement here is receptor occupancy, and that's independent of whether you or not you use BPP or BPND, you would get the same value. So I think that's all fine. Um, one thing to note, though, is that uh, body potential relative to concentration of plasma is actually not unitless, like they say here. It has the same units as VT, which is, um, which is in units of mils per cubic centimeter. Uh, so, um, just, just a note there. Um, so, they did uh, kind of conventional, um, uh, they, then they also estimated EC50 values with uh, standard modeling. So, um, again, this is uh, how you would typically estimate your receptor occupancy. This is an example that our group has done uh, with PET data for the D2, D3 system. But this is kind of the relationship that you have of, of receptor occupancy, which is calculated as the, um, you know, the percent change in binding potential um, at a given dose relative to baseline, and then plotted as a function of, of drug concentration. And you would get a typical curve like this. Um, they show it in a linear scale. I'm more used to looking at it in a logarithmic scale. But this is the general um, gist of kind of what's going on. So, OK. Um, okay, so let's jump now to the results. So this is this is kind of the I, I would say the a summary figure showing uh, first images of the different uh, carbon eleven labeled buprenorphine scans at different doses. Uh, the first thing to note is that um, they claim that there's kind of negligible um, uh, changes in, in VT with this 0.003 mix per kg, but I think that there, it does look like there might be a little bit of, of, of reduction in, in specific binding. But you, in 
general, you see this really nice dose response where with increasing, as you would expect, with increasing doses of the buprenorphine, you see the reductions in VT. Um, one of the things that they spent a lot of time focusing on is um, the use of different restaurant regions. So that would include the occipital cortex and then the cerebellum. And in both of these regions, they do, I, I mean, in this figure to my eye, it does look like you get a pretty hefty reduction in VT from the initial dose. Um, but they claim that these are, you know, reasonable um, reference regions, which I would be okay reference regions, but I think there's caveats associated with them. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable, but you would have to kind of, you know, I, I would be more careful in explaining the limitations of these reference regions if, if, if this were um, Ansel, work. Ansel, how would, how would you, um, just, just for our education value, how would you go about choosing a different one if they don't have something there that doesn't look like it's, a, you know, it looks like everything is showing some reduction, including the reference Correct. regions. Correct. <laughs> right, right. So they, it, 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 it may be that there is not a good reference region for, for this um, for this radio tracer. That's not uncommon. There are plenty of examples. I mean, for example, with the um, kappa opioid receptors that we're using in the PACE program, you know, Henry's ECAP tracer or Pete, uh, for example, that radio tracer just simply does not have a good reference region. And so at that point, you know, you can still do the arterial blood sampling and, and measurement for your studies, although, mm -hmm. you know, that, that requires, that's more invasive, it, it requires a lot of expertise. Um, to do, it's, it's a lot more challenging. Um, so then the other thing is to use a reference region, and but then it's it's key to understand the limitations of that. You know, you're probably underestimating what changes in receptor binding might be yeah. looking like if you have right. a reference region with with specific uptake. So um, I would have, you know, if if this was something that I were putting together, I would have emphasized that a little bit more strongly in the discussion. That's that's yeah. that would be the difference. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so these are the plots now that look at the, um, again, these are um, kind of the, uh, uh, you've got the VT at the um, high, high molar activity on the x-axis and then the y-axis, you've got um, your VT at, at the given uh, dose. Uh, and so the slope should give you something that's proportional to receptor occupancy. Uh, and you can see that the slope is, I'm sorry, one minus the receptor occupancy, and you can see that the slope is going um, is uh, going down as the dose goes up, as you would expect. Traditionally, we actually would use something called an occupancy plot, which on the plots on the y-axis the difference in high molar activity minus the dose, and that way the slope actually tells you um, what the receptor occupancy is. But it it's the same thing, so it's not really a problem here. Um, and then finally, they have in this table the different estimates that they have um, for uh, the both the, the non-displaceable volume distribution as well as the binding potential relative to concentration in plasma in um, the third column, uh, the different receptor occupancies as a function of brain region in the middle, and then finally the EC50 here. Um, so I think that it's the interesting thing, you know, it's not uncommon to assume that an EC50 or receptor occupancy would be roughly the same throughout the brain. Um, and so it would have been interesting to, you know, to see if, if the EC50, if that were true in these data. I don't know that they have the data to refute that potential hypothesis at this point. And, um, you know, the larger error bars that you see in the EC50 might be associated with brain regions that are either smaller or have more of a white matter component or something like that. Um, so it wouldn't be, you know, you could pool all your data from different brain regions and ideally get an EC50 with, um, with uh, higher precision. Um, that would have been something that, you know, it, it um, I think could have been worth exploring a little bit more as well uh, in these data. Um, and so along with that table, these are the, like I said, the individual curves for each. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can just get the gist of maybe, um, you know, a few of these. Oops. So um, 
again, it's not ideal. Uh, I would have shown these with the logarithmic scale on the x-axis, so it's a little hard to you know, fully evaluate it. It does look like um, you know, this doesn't particularly fit your occupancy response curve as well as you would like, and so it makes me wonder if they had to, um, they had either, you know, had noisy data or had to, you know, play around with their uh, outcome measures in order to get this to fit, um, fit these curves in more of kind of what would be an expected way. So certainly this probably contributed to the larger um, variance that they have in their EC50 values that they report. Okay, so um, the end of the uh, methods, I'm sorry, the end of the results, I should say, uh, first of all, talks about, um, uh, addresses this question a little bit more in detail of using reference regions for buprenorphine. They say that there's a strong correlation between regional VT and body potential relative to concentration in plasma. Uh, those are actually, I mean, by definition, they should be linear, I mean, BPP is calculated from VT, so they sh that I, I certainly hope that that relationship were actually the case. And you can see that, you know, it, ideally here in figure A, you see this very nice strong relationship, which is, you know, should actually be a perfect line. But um, the really key thing here is that they investigate the use of, uh, of DVR using a reference, re using the occipital cortex as a reference region um, and they still get um, these really nice linear relationships. And so this does, I think, nicely demonstrate that, um, you know, while there might be a bias of, um, of uh, estimating your, you know, your DVR using a reference region approach, basically, um, while this could be biased, um, it's probably biased in a uniform way. So it's probably, this actually supports the use of, um, of using a, a reference region approach, again, with the caveat of understanding that there is some small specific binding in that reference region that's being used. Um, okay, so I think we can, so any questions, I think, on these points before we move on to discuss, to the, to the discussion? Um, any other points that anybody wants to raise? Just had a mundane question, Ansel, whether or not, um, that tracer that was used, the, the naloxone-based antagonist tracer in the rodent studies. Anything close to that for humans in terms of uh, something, you know, like I know cyclofoxy was around for a while, but people said that wasn't a very good uh, opioid tracer. And even though we want to do competition studies, even something that would reveal, you know, even an antagonist tracer that would reveal the density of the receptors would be really Great. Do, do you know what's on the horizon? This is sort of a mundane question before you get to the meat of your article. No, no, it's 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 highly relevant actually. So, um, so buprenorphine is um, so so. First of all, I should say that uh, the the rodent studies only use buprenorphine as the radio tracer, um, and uh, you know the the different compounds were blocking were cold blocking compounds, um, and so it, it you know it, of course it can be really it's right. it, just because you have a good drug. Uh, a good co a compound that's a good drug for a given receptor. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a good ra radio chaser. There's a lot more that needs to go right yeah. for that to happen. Yeah, yeah I've but, heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I think relevant to that, let's take a peek at the buprenorphine time activity curves. Um, so I would say that you know to image mu opioid receptors, the the accepted radio tracer is carfentanil, of course, um, and so that of course has high you know very high affinity for mu opioid receptors. And that actually does present of a bit of a problem because people, you know, if you say you're doing carfentanil scanning, you know, a lot of um, people get very squeamish about that because if you, you know, we, I was talking a little bit earlier about this idea of a high molar activity scan. And if the molar activity is not quite high enough, you know, because buprenorphine, or I'm sorry, because carfentanil is so potent, um, you know, if, if your molar activity is just not quite there on a given day, you can, you know, induce pharmacological effects. So you actually have to be very, very careful yeah, it's, it's with carfentanil. I mean, it, it's, people have lived through car, carfentanil studies at Yale and, I mean the investigators, <laughs> at Yale <laughs> yeah. and, at, and at Penn, but, but it's really not much fun. And so it would be great if there were some options. And I just thought maybe as a sidebar, right. we could discuss anything that's developing in that domain. So I, I, you could actually argue that this, 
paper itself is reasonable. It you know looks at using buprenorphine, carbon eleven buprenorphine, as a safer alternative to carfentanil. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things to look at, so I'm bringing up here what the time activity curves for buprenorphine look like in, in the monkey. Um, and so uh, this looks at the radio tracer concentration as a function of time in the frontal cortex in the black and occipital cortex in the white. And so it, it, it's not as nice as carfentanil um, because ideally from these time activity curves, you would see more faster washout or in other right. words, a steeper slope. Um, and so the slower washout here means that our quantification approaches are going to be more challenging in, to, yeah. you know, in very simple terms. Um, but, you know, there's so, their work looking at the selectivity does argue that, you know, this might be selective enough for mu that it could work. And it would be, it might be a safer alternative to carfentanil if, if carfentanil were overly challenging. But, you know, I, I do think that both from a quantification perspective and you know I, I suspect that you know it's clear that for example that um, that the reference regions would have bias in them whereas for carfentanil with the occipital cortex it's actually a pretty good reference region there so that's an another you know big mm -hmm. bonus for carfentanil so I you know um, it, it's always a, a you know there's I, I don't know on the mu system if there's a ton of work I think you know Henry's work on the Kappa receptor system, and I know there's some work on delta as well. I yeah. think those are really for the opioid receptors. That's where where a lot of the work is being done. I know right it's now. just I, and that's why it's a sidebar. But you know that's it because carfentanil poses a lot of challenges just for working with it. It seems like there's really good for good room for you know a tracer either for competition or for revealing you know density something that's more quote unquote irreversibly bound. Either one. So I find myself asking that question, looking up looking toward the stars and still haven't really seen something falling down from the sky yet. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't know of anything on the horizon in that area, um, to be frank. Okay, that's fine. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's just to uh, wrap this up a little bit to talk about the discussion. So summarizing their, you know, saying that this is what we discussed already in the rodent studies. They show that this is um, primarily um, primarily mu opioid receptor specific binding that we're looking at with the um, with the radio labeled buprenorphine. Uh, so they did a comparison with some published data looking at dipronorphine, which is also a non-selective opioid receptor radio tracer, and then carfentanil, which is more mu selective. And this sentence in the paper makes the claim that uh, buprenorphine is does a better job matching carfentanil to that of dipronorphine, but if you go actually to the supplemental data, um, I don't know that that's really clear. You just even though you, I mean, it, it is true you have higher R squared values for carfentanil compared to dipronorphine, but they're they're quite good in both cases, which is not surprising actually. And so I think it's hard, you know, and it's not clear to me that it's actually better with carfentanil compared to dipronorphine. So uh, um, I would push back on that a little bit. I think that they would need to do a little bit more work to say that it's more mu rather than non-selective. Um, I don't know that I completely agree with this claim in the sentence. Um, but you know, it, it, I think it is fair to say that most of what you're looking at is mu. Um, and, and but that's also the same really for dipronorphine, which is another uh, non-selective radio tracer. Um, so this next paragraph addresses the question of a reference region uh, with the occipital cortex, I think, which we've already discussed. Um, and and you know you you could probably use um, use it, but there are there would be limitations. Um, so the final take home, and I found myself in reading this paper wishing that this were stressed more. But the kind of in the in the so what question for this paper, um, so they discussed that um, you know the analgesic doses used for buprenorphine correspond to a receptor occupancy that is less than fifty percent in the thalamus, whereas um, <clears throat> the concentrations um, you know people have. They, they say that in the literature, people have suggested that you would want more than 50% receptor occupancy for to suppress withdrawal syndrome, and then more than 
receptor occupancy to protect against opioid overdose. Um, and so they claim that we that the plasma concentrations, well, based on their data, the plasma concentrations in monkey would be seven micrograms per liter um, to ensure 90% receptor occupancy, and, and that would actually be an increase in the dose of what's typically used in the clinic. Now, of course, there's also the consideration of what side effects would be and, and um, those kinds of things. Um, but I do think that uh, this is, um, you know, this, this is an interesting point that I, I wish, I found myself wishing were, were fleshed out in a, in a more clear uh, way in this paper. Um, and, and I think really that's, that's about it. Um, you know, the, the conclusion has this kind of weird point about saying that buprenorphine could also be an interesting uh, dual modality biomarker with PET and then PHMRI studies. Uh, and and I, I don't really know, it's, it's not clear to me what the authors had in mind with, with those sentences, but um, that would be interesting if they could expand on that more too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that kind of summarizes the paper, but I'm happy to discuss more if, if anybody else has other points to raise. It's, I think it's wonderful that you were able to catch the various sort of, I'll call them, you know, minor and not so minor technical things. It's interesting how things, just as a sidebar, sort of are, are reviewed and get into neuropsychopharmacology, for example, which is, uh, you know, it's a journal which has a pretty good impact factor, but, but there are quite a few little loose ends here and pieces that seems like somebody should have caught along the way, either the authors or the reviewers or the editors or somebody. But I, I, I agree. I find myself a little disappointed in the reviewers, actually, for not pressing them on more details in, in, in a lot of cases. Yeah. I guess the other, the other sidebar for me is that, you know, buprenorphine, because of its kappa antagonist profile, people have pointed to its potential as an antidepressant. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's was at one point writing sort of a wave of what if, you know, for people that have treatment-resistant depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder, because I don't know, and I haven't read that literature, whether they've been looking very much in trials at occupancy in people who are depressed, seeing if they get better, seeing how occupancy changes you know, seeing what the kappa receptor, I wonder if any of that stuff has been developed with PET in terms of that question about applicability, one step to the side of addiction, where we know that there's a benefit mm -hmm. for, yes, for withdrawal symptoms and for protection against overdose. Nobody doubts that. Uh, but it would be a win-win if it worked in that comorbidity. Do you know anything about that and whether or not PET has been brought to bear to understand if it is its actions through kappa that are responsible for its apparent antidepressant benefits and if there's a steady relationship? Well, yeah, I, 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 I'm not aware of any. And actually this paper kind of says that that would be a really challenging thing to do since kappa opioid receptor binding of buprenorphine is really small to begin with. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, um, and, and also, you know, the other piece of that is that because the kappa opioid receptor ligands that we do have um, are so new, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, um, it's, 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 because that would be the, the best way to do it would be to do mm -hmm. sort of an occupancy study with a kappa opioid receptor right. specific right. ligand. Right. And, and I'm not where, I, it would be nice, I, you know, and it's possible. I'm not, I'm not. I don't well, you know, there's been, as you know, there's been wonderful progress at Yale on kappa <laughs> tracers, mm -hmm. and so it, it seems that it would be one of the places um, that one could look, both for predicting benefits of buprenorphine in the addiction domain, but especially in the comorbidity domain. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. If that's been done, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. I'm not either, but I thought you might have bumped into it. Other questions or thoughts, comments, clinical or preclinical, all are welcome. Some of the those of you who have lived through carfentanil imaging experiences want to, want to share, get some group support. <laughs> the point that you made about um, the depression literature is actually partly what prompted my comment early on about the fact that the uh, the lack, the apparent lack of binding to kappa receptors is not consonant with with the in vitro pharmacology, where where I think that approach was was first identified as potentially uh, useful. Um, 
I know that there are candidates that have been developed for use um, in in uh, blocking kappa uh, receptors uh, for treating for treating depression. I don't know that anything's gotten to phase three yet, but um, but it's still it kind of surprised me to to see um, these data. And and you know we were planning on uh, doing a kappa study. Uh, and looking a kappa ligand and looking at buprenorphine effects in the explorer. Um, and this has kind of gotten us thinking a little differently, uh, maybe just going with carfentanil. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Ansel? Yeah, I mean, well, as, as I was just talking with Anna Rose about her question, I was like, well, we, we are kind of thinking of maybe just doing exactly that study, right? Um, with the kappa and it's not you know it's not unreasonable to do because if we are um because if we have a kappa selective radio ligand you know the it's just the the b max of, of mu is really in this case and you know an order of magnetic magnetivity is, 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 a, is a solid difference so you know it's not surprising to me that it's dot that the the binding potential we have here is dominated by mu. It doesn't mean that the kappa is not there, you know? And so if we have a kappa selective radio tracer, um, it's still worth doing. I think I, this doesn't necessarily discourage me from wanting to do a, a kappa selective study with, um, with a buprenorphine block, actually. Um, I think that would be relevant, but uh, it does, it does speak to uh, the necessity, I think, of doing Carfentanil along with that, I guess. Yeah, yeah the that's, two things that seem like they would inform each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wait, could, could you, with the radioactivity limits, could you do that within participants, within subjects? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, um, if you use a, if you used ECAP, which is the carbon eleven version of Kappa, the dosimetry that you have from a carbon eleven the scan is, is is not that long. Large. So it, it, it's very common. We actually, at Yale, we actually frequently do same-day carbon-11 scans. It's, it's a nice thing um, yeah. to do same-day challenges. So, right. um, yeah, I don't think that would be a problem to do two scans in one person. That would help with the intersubject variability, which is always, in any of these studies, you know, <laughs> the between-subjects variability is sometimes great. So having a within-subjects scan pair would be, would be a way of helping with that. Well, hey, Ansel, it's a little bit of an aside, but um, I was just thinking about how, we're, how there's a lot of times we don't have a good reference region when we're doing this brain mm -hmm. imaging. But with both Yale and, and us now going towards having these closer to whole body uh, imaging systems, I'm wondering whether uh, the disadvantage is sometimes it's hard to get that arterial blood sample out of the whole body scanner. I'm wondering what are kind of the minimum, minimum criteria to uh, switch to doing venous sampling, with the idea being, you have like the a big blood pool in the field of view, you got a perfect shape of your of your uh, arterial input function, uh, as long as you can just convert that to whole blood, you know, the whole blood to plasma measures. So, so I'm, you're I'm talking image. To... Go ahead. Are, are are you are you talking more of an in, image derived measurement or a, 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 a venous plasma measurement? Well, I'm thinking, what do we have to do to move from doing all the arterial blood sampling? So, yeah. So, in the ideal, I mean, in the ideal case, um, you know, what what our kind of template for doing that is is you know the the, the arterial blood sampling is your gold standard, and then we do the venous blood sampling, um, and we just do a comparison between the two because. You know, the parent fraction or radioactivity concentration in venous plasma is not always as close to a match as arterial as you would like it to be, right? Right. So, and that works better or worse for some radio tracers rather than others. Um, and you also, you know, the, the plasma to whole blood ratio, of course, also needs to be stable, you know, at a given time. Um, and so I think it's, it, you know, as much as I would like to have a template answer, unfortunately, it's more of just like a trial and error measurement and just, to see because it's it's hard to predict ahead of time how those things are gonna gonna look to each other. Um, one good candidate for that because 
can you remind me the nicotinic ligand that you're using that Jake is using? Uh, is it the two FA or two FA? So two FA is probably a good candidate for that because it has a very high parent fraction. Um, but actually, yeah, it should be, and it's a slower radio tracer. So you know that's that's a more of a reasonable candidate for that. But the other thing is for a radio tracer that has faster clearance, then it can be more difficult because since things are just moving faster, getting those equilibration or pseudo equilibration ratios is more challenging. All right. Let's... So, well, at least would you think the key uh, comparisons you'd want to see as a reviewer would be the plasma, the whole blood, the uh, metabolites in Venus versus um, material, and maybe just a, a basic tack of uh, material versus Venus? I'm just... I, I... Yeah, I know so, there's no template answer. I'm just trying to, I, I want to move towards that because it's going to be a little harder uh -huh. for us to get some material sampling in our whole body scanner. So I'm trying to right. do it faster yeah. than we might otherwise do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's um, that's reasonable. Um, the, the plasma to whole blood is a, a really key one for that. And, right. and just, you know, so the other one would actually be measuring the parrot fraction both in, the vena, in a venous sample and in an arterial sample, which which makes it like more complicated because that can be a crazy day for the metabolite lab to do all of yes. those measurements. Um, but you know, there are instances where those things don't equilibrate as nicely as you would, or pseudo equilibrate as nicely as you would like them to. Um, so I think that, that unfortunately is, 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 is a key measurement as well. Okay. Thanks. Sorry to get off on, on topic. No, but... no problem.